Did you know it's possible to make accurate predictions about the future without psychic powers? Given the right practice and strategies to explore, you can become what's known as a super forecaster. We read the book Super Forecasting by Wharton professor Philip E. Tetlock and co-author Dan Gardner. In this video, we'll share the top five insights, qualities, and skills that make a super forecaster, including frameworks for how to break down even the most difficult questions to achieve the best results. Real quick, for those of you who don't know us, we analyze business frameworks and summarize business books to stay on top of the latest business strategies. Professor Philip E. Tetlock currently holds the Annenberg University Professorship at the University of Pennsylvania and teaches in the Wharton School of Psychology Department. Tetlock has been sponsored by the U.S. government to create forecasting tournaments through the Good Judgment Project with his wife and research partner, Barbara Mellers. The original goal of the project was to improve geopolitical and geoeconomic forecasting to more accurately answer questions like, how likely is a head of start to resign by a target date? Or, what is the likelihood of naval clashes that claim over 10 lives in the East China Sea? Through the research, they discovered that good forecasting does not require powerful computers or ultra-scientific algorithms, but it involves a series of about 5 to 10 tactics that can be taught. They then published the findings in this book. So. How do you start to predict the future? For super forecasters, beliefs are hypotheses to be tested. When posed with a big question, triage the situation. Go for the Goldilocks zone, i.e. somewhere in the middle and work your way outward. Focus on questions where your hard work is likely to pay off, as opposed to the hardest or the easiest questions. If you were to sum it up to forecasting in one word, it might be balance. This doesn't mean that your predictions should always be somewhere in the middle. But take everything into consideration, even if it contrasts with your current view. A closer inspection might introduce a factor you hadn't thought of that alters the course of your probabilities. Also, when you make a prediction, be as precise as possible. If the prediction is too vague, you can run into the forer effect, which people assume its meaning and apply it to themselves. Forecasters run into several barriers that impact accuracy. People typically rely on vague verbiage forecasts. They, people say, well, I think it's possible, or this could happen, this might happen, it's likely. Um, those are terms that you know, are informative at some level, but they're not all that informative. Um, if, you, if I say that something could happen, for example, you know, Greece could leave the Eurozone by the end of 2017, what does that mean? It could, I, it could mean I think there's a probability of 1% or 99%. Uh, Vague language such as significant market share can be interpreted based on the reader's biases and not facts. Therefore, it's better to make predictions in terms of a specific outcome and its probability of likelihood to occur. Sometimes, you need to tweak the wording of a question to get another perspective. For example, will the South African government grant the Dalai Lama a visa within six months? In addition to reasons why they would, look at reasons why they wouldn't. Change the word grant to deny, and now you have new criteria for research. What about when you don't know too much about a subject? Strike the right balance between inside and outside views. Inside views are specific to the situation, such as recent events. Outside views are more generic, like how often the situation at hand occurs on average. History tends to repeat itself. Even surprisingly unique events can relate to trends, which are then weighted against inside views. Put the problem into a comparative perspective that downplays the situation's uniqueness. Look at factors that play up a situation's uniqueness and synchronize your findings to make as precise of a judgment as you can. For example, let's say you're a homicide detective and you need to find out who did it. First, you check the outside view. Refer to statistics as a base rate. The FBI says that 28.3% of homicide victims are killed by someone they know. So, there's a 28.3% chance the victim knew their killer. Likewise, there's a 9% chance it was a stranger. Next, check the inside view. Examine facts specific to the case. Who had the ability, means, and motive for killing this person? Adjust your chance percentile up or down based on each suspect. Start with the most obvious and move your way outward. If the victim had a recent fight with their significant other, the likelihood that this person killed them goes up. If that significant other had a verifiable alibi, the likelihood goes down. Now, merge the two views to create a synthesized prediction. Let's say the victim was seen getting into a car the night they were killed. You've identified a person that worked with the victim who drove the same exact car. Coworkers say that the person was obsessed with the victim, their alibi is weak, and they look like they're the strongest suspect. Therefore, you come up with a 75% chance that this person is your culprit. But what about if you receive new information? What do you do then? Tetlock shares that a Presbyterian minister in the 1700s by the name of Thomas Bayes wrote an essay on how to solve a problem in what he called the Doctrine of Chances. 
Essentially, the theorem says that your new belief should depend on your prior belief multiplied by the diagnostic value of the new information. While super forecasters should have a basic knowledge of arithmetic, they don't have to turn to algebra each time they make a prediction. What matters more is Bayes' core insight of getting closer to the truth gradually by updating in proportion to the weight of the evidence. For instance, consider the homicide investigation example from before. You might update your prediction and increase the likelihood of one subject being the killer once you find out that they lied about their whereabouts. But if you overreact, you could overlook other unknowns, such as the reasons why they lied, to save their job, to save their spouse's feelings, etc. Super forecasters adjust their views in light of new information as often as necessary to draw the most accurate conclusion. Carefully balance the old with the new and incorporate both into your latest prediction. Update often, but in small increments. Tetlock has another framework to solve problems and uses the Fermi problem as an example. Italian-American physicist Enrico Fermi posed a brain teaser for forecasting that asks how many piano tuners are in Chicago. Without looking at the internet, a forecaster should be able to come up with an educated answer if they know four things. One, the number of pianos in Chicago. Two, how often pianos are tuned each year. Three, how long it takes to tune a piano. And four, how many hours a year the average piano tuner works. Fermi teaches to break down the question into separate categories as knowable and unknowable. Despite the seemingly random nature of the answers, the result tends to be more accurate than a random guess. Many attempted the puzzle, but one presentation by psychologist Daniel Levitin shows how to come up with a solution. For the first answer, set a confident interval, a range you are 90% sure contains the right answer. Levitin guessed that Chicago has around 2.5 million people because it is smaller than Los Angeles, but large enough to house over 1.5 million residents. Next, Levitin supposed that a piano might need tuning once per year. Since pianos are too expensive for most families, Levitin guessed that one out of 100 homes in Chicago own a piano. He doubled that number to factor in schools and concert halls that possess more than one. Out of 2.5 million residents, multiplied by 2% meant that there were around 50,000 pianos in Chicago. Then, Levitin guessed that it takes around two hours to tune a piano. With an assumption that a piano tuner works 40 hours a week, plus a two weeks vacation, and spends around 20% of their time driving from job to job, the average piano tuner might work around 1,600 hours per year. Therefore, if 50,000 pianos need to be tuned once a year, and it takes two hours to tune one piano, that comes out to 100,000 total piano tuning hours. If you divide that by the annual hours worked by one piano tuner, it comes out to 62.5 piano tuners in Chicago. Sure enough, Levitin found 83 listings for piano tuners in Chicago, but many were duplicates, such as businesses with more than one phone number. While the exact number isn't known, Levitin's calculation shows how close you can get. To be a super forecaster, you need only to 1. Develop the ability to think in probabilities, 2. Gather evidence from a variety of sources, 3. Work in a team, 4. Keep score of predictions, and 5. Admit error and change course when wrong. Learning requires doing, with good feedback that leaves no ambiguity on whether you are on the right track. Practice is not helpful if you simply just go through the forecasting motions. Super forecasting is the product of deep, deliberate practice and requires constant mindfulness even when you try to follow the rules. While complex algorithms that feed into supercomputers may soon complement forecast endeavors, as of right now, only humans can understand human meaning. For more insights from the book Super Forecasting, check out the link in the description, where you can read the full book summary. Thank you so much for watching, and if you like this video, you can gain more business frameworks and summaries from our library. Just check out the link in the description.